Um, so thank you again for coming to the Smart on Crime conference. This panel is uh, entitled Fair Chance Hiring? Question mark, And I would like to start with an emphatic yes, Fair Chance Hiring. Um, that has always been my employer's position. Uh, I'm Senior Policy Analyst at Coke Industries. My name is Silas Horst. I've worked on criminal justice issues at Coke Industries for about four years now. And we have assembled a panel here today to talk about specifically employment and fair chance hiring opportunities to start with. And then I imagine we will end up in a discussion about what opportunity looks like for people as they exit our criminal justice system more broadly. Uh, so I'm not going to take much more time. I'm going to let these folks introduce themselves and their great work. And John Viev, if you'd like to go ahead and start. My name is Jean Viev Martin. I'm the executive director of the Dave's Killer Bread Foundation, which is the nonprofit branch of the nation's number one selling sliced organic bread. Uh, that's just my little plug. Uh, so what we do as a foundation is we work directly with other employers in really breaking down and humanizing the narrative around people with criminal backgrounds and challenging folks to embrace hiring folks. Um, if you have gold standard best practices in place already as an employer, there's no reason you can't do this work. Hello, I'm Jonathan Halperin. I'm the head of, is this working? Yeah. The head of external affairs at Grayston. Um, so we practice open hiring at, do you want us to make little comments or just who we are? Little comments now? No, you can explain what open Okay, okay. So um, I'll explain open hiring in a minute, but so we have, we have some rules, even though we have open hiring at Grace, and one of those rules is not to follow Dion Drew, who just did the film that some of us saw downstairs, but nonetheless, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to violate that rule because we're also sort of innovative and creative, we think, at Grayston. Um, so open hiring means that folks, whether it's Dion or folks coming as returning citizens from prison or from any other place whereby they can't typically get work because they are systemically excluded from being hired, open hiring means you put your name on a waiting list, you put your cell phone on the list, when a job comes up and you're next on the list, you get the job. Period. Full stop. No questions asked. You show up, you get paid for your first day of work, you've started an apprenticeship program, and you are employed. We at Grayston have been doing this for 35 years, successfully, as a commercial, now world-class bakery, producing roughly 35,000 pounds of brownies every day for Ben and Jerry's. So if you've had chocolate fudge brownie or other Ben and Jerry's ice creams, you've had Grayston brownies. If you haven't, and you're staying for the reception tonight, you'll get some brownies there as well. <laughs> um, so we're a purpose-driven, mission-driven organization in addition to being a world-class bakery that's part of the Unilever ecosystem. So our purpose is open hiring. We're, the, we're New York State's first registered benefit corporation, which gives us the opportunity to take that mission as seriously as we take our fiduciary responsibilities. We are scaling this because we know that we can make great brownies, we think, but we can't see the kind of change globally and nationally that we want just by doubling, tripling, quadrupling brownie production. So we're teaching other folks how to do it. Working with early adopters through something we're calling the Center for Open Hiring so that we can grow the practice beyond the place where it started. So I'll answer questions about Dion. I can answer questions about the center. I can answer questions about open hiring. But for now, that's like an introduction. Good afternoon. My name is Nina Walker Staley. I work for the South Carolina Department of Corrections. When I met Silas, I was the warden at Manning uh, Reentry Work Release Center. Uh, the name was changed earlier this year when, um, when I went there, it was Manning Correctional. And because of the mission of Manning, I decided that the name needed to match what we do. And that is prepare returning citizens to go back into society. Um, I'm a different kind of warden, so I think that's the reason why I'm here today. It's because, well, I'm now an assistant division director, assistant deputy director of programs and reentry, which is um, a division that uh, gives me the opportunity to not only uh, help completely develop Manning reentry, but also start a reentry program for women and for level two, which is the medium security institutions and maximum security institutions statewide. So um, the Manning reentry was a level one, which is a min minimum security institution. So what we have done at that level one institution, they'd like to see mirrored statewide. So I'm excited about that 
uh, opportunity to be able to uh, prepare citizens to go back out and be successful. We partnered with the Department of Employment and Workforce who has um, uh, office space inside the institution to work with development, uh, helping the guys learn how to build resumes, cover letters, and, and uh, explain the tax credit and uh, the federal bonding that comes with uh, hiring ex-offenders. So um, that's what I'm here for today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the first question I'm going to pose to the panel is very broad, but I think for all of us, we actually come at this problem from a different perspective. At Coke Industries, um, the answer looks a lot different from, for example, what the South Carolina Department of Corrections would be asking of businesses. So the question for you guys, and we can just go down the line, is what role do businesses actually have to play in both the narrow role as hirer of somebody who has left a correctional facility, and then in the larger role as a business uh, when you think about their impact on society more broadly, uh, because w at our company for a long time, we've been trying to go to other businesses and say, you have a stake in what happens in the criminal justice system before they get arrested, frankly. But you know, if we can just talk about maybe hiring, we'll start there and then we can kind of work our way back. So what role should businesses play in hiring and what role do you think businesses need to play in the broader picture around criminal justice reform? Me first? Go for it. Okay. Simple question. <clears throat> sure, yeah, we'll just do this. <clears throat> okay, so as an employer, it's, it's really very simple. You don't need anything different or new in order to embrace this part of the workforce in your, your talent pipeline. I'd say the biggest piece and the largest opportunity as an employer that you have is a completely new set of recruiting pipelines that you may have never considered before. Um, so I regularly talk about going and creating relationships with either social enterprises that provide transitional employment directly out of um, reentry service organizations or workforce development boards are a huge boon to folks in an underutilized program. Um, so that, as an employer, I mean, that's just simple, low-hanging fruit that you could change tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, in the broader picture of criminal justice reform, <clears throat> I'm not going to say that we don't have a role. I will say that um, ourselves, we would see it more important just to embrace people and allow them to have opportunity and to succeed and really lift folks up um, through traditional employment. We're just we're a private sector business. We're there to make money like everybody else. Um, but by providing that opportunity and not seeing people for the mistake that they made in their past and rather for what their potential is and how they can fulfill that is our role. We, we don't want to be waiting for legislation or government agencies to tell us, hey, you have to do this because we're now mandating it. We want to be ahead of the curve and doing that in the best way possible uh, to kind of mitigate that. Uh, so let, let me try and break this down into a couple different different pieces, right? So let's say one whole theme here, I would say, is systems. Right? So we have the business systems, the healthcare systems, the housing systems, the criminal justice system, the mass incarceration system that we have, not because they were handed down from some cosmic or some spiritual force, but we created them. And we have the outcomes of the systems we've created that we're trying to deal with now. So we have to think about this on a systems level basis in terms of looking at root cause analysis and looking at ways we can change things that have the same kind of ripple effects that have created the systems that we may or may not like that we have now. So we have to keep that in mind, I think, as we're looking at this, because it's not just business, it's business in a community. It's not just crime, it's crime and poverty and recidivism and housing and homelessness and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as a business, there, there are a couple slices, right? So, so we are in a competitive space. You know, brown, lots of people make brownies, right? So we make a really good brownie. But as a purpose-driven business, we have a set of business benefits that other folks don't get. Um, that are that are bottom line benefits, right? So we have higher retention rates. Rates we have lower onboarding costs by about 50% lower than the typical onboarding cost as as measured by the Society for Human Resources Management, right? So we have brand value that goes into the company based on our open hiring policy. Um, we have uh, the ability to attract millennial talent 
because millennials want to work at companies increasingly, and all the data shows this, want to work at companies that do something other than or in addition to making a product. So there's a whole host of sort of business specific, not social mission driven values and benefits that come from having a purpose. Okay, the, the mission, however, of Grayson is to create thriving communities. And we do that through open hiring. So as a business, as employers, as employees, as an institution that is grounded in a place, we want to live, I would argue all of us, in a community that's thriving, right? And if, if we are not dealing with 700,000 people who are released from prison every year in a successful manner, if we're not dealing with creating jobs for people who maybe temporarily were homeless and can't therefore put an address on a job application, if we're not building a community that can address the kinds of challenges, as businesses, we're gonna struggle because that's not gonna be sustainable as a business operation because the community's not sustainable. One last quick thing and then Ed, please. So time matters a lot here, right? So if you're in the if, if your goal is quarterly, short-term maximization of profits, period, full stop, a lot of this is problematic. If you're in business or if you're the purpose of what we're doing has a longer-term horizon that includes, as a business, making money, but also has a goal that is long-term value creation for shareholders and stakeholders, then you can get a lot of different things done, and that sense of where we sit and what we're trying to accomplish over what period of time matters a lot. Oh my goodness, I have so much to say. I just hope I can get it all in in one <laughs> breath. Um, one of the things that we're learning in South Carolina is that businesses need to be educated on what an offender learns while they're inside. Um, when they come out into the community, they're, they're ready to work. We've worked them the whole time that they're inside. They, re they learn trades, they get on the job training, they are ready to work. But when they come out, the barriers that they meet, the rejection that they meet comes from guidelines that the businesses have put on their, on their business to keep from hiring them. I was in a forum about two weeks ago and I had an employer tell me that, well, after they uh, spend that time that they have to spend before we can hire them, up after about a year, we hired them. I said, well, what's that, what's that time? Where'd you get that from? And she couldn't answer me. In that same forum were three judges, three retired judges. And I said, well, this is a perfect setting because never have I been in a place where I had three retired judges. So I have to ask them, what is it when you sentence a person, do you sentence them to do 10 years plus one year of unemployment or plus three years of unemployment? And they laughed, they said, absolutely not. We sentence them to serve their time. And so after they serve their time, if we reject them from being hired, we have just sentenced them to come back to prison. If a person cannot take care of themselves, they're gonna come back in. And so the, the restrictions that companies have on their own businesses is what's hindering the hiring force. Uh, one of my partners in the community, and I'll, I'll end it in a minute, but one of my partners in the community that, that has a tire, they make tires. And um, RMS is a company um, which I've asked permission to use their name, but they're, they're a company who, who has partnered with, the, with the Corrections, South Carolina Department of Corrections, to hire returning citizens to, they, they're so on board that they purchased two new forklifts and placed them inside the prison. They sent someone into the prison to train staff uh, how to train the returning citizens prior to release so that they will know how to drive a forklift uh, so that when they get out, they'll be ready because they have hiring our guys. They work really well and they said, but the time that we waste when we get out is training them how to drive that forklift. So they bought the, the forklifts inside to train them. So now when they go to work, they're, they already have that certification. They're ready to work. They come in to work with full benefits. They're not temporary employees. They come into the job with full benefits. And that's just one of the companies. But that's the kind of mindset that I think that we have to look at as a nation is coming inside, partnering, getting to know those the uh, uh, returning citizens prior to them being released, 
and, and just forgive me for saying offenders or returning citizens because as an agency, we're transitioning, learning how to speak differently. Um, I was so impressed. I was waiting on Mr. Atkinson this morning to tell me, he said, you want to ask what you should call us? I, I wrote it down. I'm like, what, what the, what the, and he never said it. I said, oh, you didn't tell me. <laughs> so, you know, so we use returning citizens right now. Um, and uh, that's something that I'm trying to make sure that our agency learns as a whole. That's my task, is to get the whole agency to look at uh, reentry on a different, uh, with a different mindset. Yeah, and I would, I would absolutely agree with that. When we, we see a lot in our work that if we, if we approach, uh, you know, a thought leader with a message around uh, justice, right? Even even some of the things we talk about in this conference, effective justice, evidence-driven justice. You know, sometimes they're 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 just a little disinterested. But if you say, you know, workforce development, oh, suddenly you know, suddenly it's about something slightly different, and and then you can sort of open the door and have a more honest conversation about, you know, you would be having these folks going into these positions, but for. Um, so I, I wanted to take a one quick step back, and John Viev, if you would. Could you, um, could you explain what happened under the former administration and what the fair chance hiring pledge was and sort of, and if, do you, I don't remember exactly what they put under it, so I'm going to put you on the spot, but there, there was a, a very large national initiative to get businesses to commit to, not necessarily a Grayson model, because that's, they're, they're doing an incredible different type of thing, but uh, to get, I think they had almost 300 businesses at the end of the day, and uh, some colleges too that committed to a pledge. Sure. So the White House Fair Chance Business Pledge kicked off last, not this last April, the April prior to that. And I think at end of day, it brought in like 287 organizations that all signed on to a pledge saying, we are committed to this work. We believe in hiring folks with backgrounds. We stand by that commitment. And we are pledging to do something within our community. So whether that is reaching out to the local community and saying, hey, this is work that we do, or hosting a training, or something like that. The fun part that I don't know if Silas wants me to talk about is that there were no teeth or accountability in the pledge. So any organization could sign this pledge, and it didn't actually hold any weight other than there's some really incredible names on that list. Um, we actually had a, a convening at the White House in October of uh, 2016 with about 15 of those organizations talking about, okay, now how do we keep moving that needle further? Okay, we, we got people signed on, now what do we do next? And it was a really incredible meeting to sit there and listen to these folks and, and talk together about what we're gonna do. And uh, surprise, surprise, nothing has happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a lot of continuing conversations in smaller groups, but because it's not something that had weight attached to it, because there isn't a body that's able to usher that forward and do more with it, it's it's kind of died on the vine. It was a it was a missed opportunity. It was a great beginning to something had it continued on. Um, so we do have some work coming down. <laughs> We're gonna try to kick that back into gear actually by creating a second chance business coalition to kind of reunite some of those folks that truly embrace it and champion the work openly. Because that became one of the tricks is you'd reach out to some of these organizations and they wouldn't talk about it ever again. They'd sign a pledge, but then they wouldn't say yes, and here's how we do it, and this is what we do, and this is the impact it's had in our organization. Um, so we're gonna work on that. It's gonna be a slow and steady process, but. It's an important one. If I can, just without making a lot of static, I hope, um, pivot off of that. I agree with almost everything you said, Jean-Vierre. I think there actually are things happening, though, that are not led by the White House and by that coalition anymore. But I think that there is a, there is a more robust dialogue now about the role for, of business innovation and innovation in HR and in talent management and how that can drive social inclusion. I think that is coming and coming fast. We see lots of companies coming to us who are either early adopters or potential early adopters. And I think the phrase that we use to tie a lot of these things together, whether it's fair chance or open or values led hiring, all different phrases that have somewhat different meanings, but it's all about the dignity of work and that anybody who wants 
a job and is willing to work should be afforded the opportunity to experience the dignity of work. And that is potentially transformational. Whether it's one person or one community or one company, that is a transformational process that lots of organizations, lots of companies are, are beginning to assess, explore, and some do. Um, so yes, our, your, your point is well taken. Our, our completely no questions asked policy is an approach that's worked is really simple in some ways. So it's not contingent hiring. It really reduces a lot of those costs for screening people out rather than investing to bring them in, which is the way we think of spending, you know, the Grayston resources. Um, but but it is it is for some too much. But there's a lot of ways to deal with managing talent, bringing greater diversity, getting new opinions, and accessing a talent and a labor pool that have been ignored and not just ignored, but systemically excluded. Um, and that's really it's just it's bad for business. It's bad for society. And I think the progressive companies are in in the world really see that, and it's going to change with or without the White House initiative, which was very helpful and would be helpful again, but it's not going to be forthcoming, I think. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Nina, so when I think about what happens to people when they're incarcerated, um, it I'm sorry, but it just doesn't come to my mind that they're spending a lot of time working and learning skills, and that might be because you know, I'm, I'm taking in a lot of information that is just negative and it's processed through a lens of the system has been so bad for so long to so many people that you just can't do it in this system. So, you know, I remember when I met you, you were excited. It was like 11 a.m. on a Wednesday and you are fired up because you've got, you know, 500 guys who are just about to leave and you've had them for, I think, six months. You know, you had them right at the period, the inflection point, so to speak, right before they leave, right before they're back among the general population in South Carolina. Um, so I guess the, the question is, was it something with you? Was it something with leadership? How do you get a system that has supposedly been, or in all these systems, so bad to so many people for so long, how do, you, how do we find more of you? And how do we turn it into, you know, we have these guys for the time that we have them, and we can do so much. Mm -hmm. But t tell me how you ended up you know, at Manning, running that program, and what you, what you see foresee for your new sort of department-wide effort. I, I feel like I've been groomed for this my whole career, 30 years in corrections at a time that I should be thinking about retiring. Um, I've been tasked with something that has been my passion my whole career. Uh, every place I've worked in the agency, I've always been tasked with a 30-day pre-release program. I think my whole, I know my whole career we've done it wrong. And I say that all the time. We, we, we're doing it wrong. Uh, 30 days to bring in volunteers uh, or resources from the outside and give them just a snippet of where to go for resources and where to, how to look for jobs is not working. Um, about six years ago, we had uh, uh, Director Byers came in to our, he was the ex-judge that came into our system and he had a vision of having a six month pre-release program, a centralized program at a level one institution, which is how uh, Manning turned into a level, uh, a level one uh, pre-release facility. And it wasn't until three years ago that I became the warden there. When I walked in the door, I, I agree with you. Um, I didn't uh, see it as being some place that a person could come out and be productive. They were kind of defiant about what we were trying to do for them. It didn't have everything in place the way it needed to be in place. Um, I do believe that every agency nationally needs to be educated on how we can do things differently. We warehouse these guys. We, we work them. They get skills, um, which you will see in our video that's coming up. Um, but they get all kinds of skills inside. When I look at these hardwood floors, I know our guys scrape floors. They make high, hardwood floors, and they're, they're sent all over the you know, United States. They're beautiful floors that we walk on. They make furniture. They, uh, they do welding. They run the, the, the machines that, the asphalt, uh, asphalt machines that, um, that make our highways better. Uh, you name it, they make all the highway signs that's, that's out there. They have skills. And we work them inside, but when it's time to go home, they're, they're rejected. So 
what I did when I got uh, to Manning was I tried to uh, come to come up with an assessment that would let me help me understand what their need is now if they have anything that's waiting on them or jobs that's that's going to be waiting on them we partnered with uh, Department of Employment and Workforce our director Sterling placed that uh, uh, partnered with the Department of Employment and Workforce, placed them inside the institution, along with vocational rehabilitation services and other uh, outside entities that could mentor our guys prior to them going out. And uh, of course, track their on-the-job training to make sure that they had skills that, that could be marketable outside, making sure they had their education prior to getting out, as well as uh, training. And, with that in place and partnering with our uh, SC Works, which is our employment office on the outside uh, in, in the community, they have uh, decided to go to every institution in the state of South Carolina right before inmates go out, register them. And I'm sorry for those that don't like the word inmates, but I, I still work in the system. Uh, but they, um, they, go, they come in and they get them registered so that when, when you're released, you don't have to, to be uh, afraid of saying, I'm just getting out, I need help. And uh, when they walk in and they give them their name, it automatically shows all the skills that they've done inside the system. South Carolina Department of Corrections has a skills button on the screen that shows if you push it and put that person's name in, it tells you every job they held inside, what skills they gained inside. That's a work history for them. And so uh, do we need more of me? I would say yes. But I would also say that it also takes the whole agency, you know, the state, the community, everybody. It's, it's not just, it takes a village. And, and I have to say that because it's not anything that I could do by myself. Yeah. And can we actually, that's a good, that's a good point. Could we get the South Carolina Department video to play? All right, that, that's all right. Um, Nina, Dave, the conference has that, right? Dave? It is, and it's, it's, if you look at uh, Department of Corrections, South Carolina Department of Corrections website, the video is on the website. That's uh, Ms. Nikki Haley, who was the governor of South Carolina. She uh, was very instrumental in helping our uh, initiative move forward for reentry. Um, when I was the warden at Manning, she actually came and met with the uh, returning citizens to let them know what, what her push was going to be in the community with the encouraging employers to hire them once they are released and has been true to her, was true to her word on that. Um, Director Sterling is very uh, vocal in, in uh, making sure that the community knows what our offenders are trained on. Um, they work in print shops, have very high technical skills. Um, you know, they're, they're ready to work when they're released. And we, we train them all of these things while they're incarcerated. And um, they, they come out and they almost have lost all desire to even try. And I, I also used to manage the reception and evaluation center where I saw them come in on the buses every day. So working on the back end of it and knowing how important it is to give them what they need before they go out, knowing how important it is to not only address reentry going out but address it coming in has become paramount to me and a, a, a mission for me. So I have a strong desire to make sure that we prepare um, offenders to stay out and not come back. And you know, I was just uh, sharing this morning, I'm gonna make it brief, but it was amazing that I'm here today and my assistant sent me uh, an email saying that we had, I had a phone call from a guy who had been out 11 months, his first time being able to stay out 11 months. By four months, he's usually back in the system. And he called to thank me because we have a clothing closet that I, we helped prepare him with clothing to go to work every day. He said not having to worry about clothing and being in a transitional house was important for him. He had a job waiting on him, which we found for him before he was released. And uh, he now has a one-bedroom apartment, and he has two jobs. So he called 
to tell her to tell me thank you and she sent me his number she said when you get back home please call him because he was so excited I called him last night he was crying on the phone because he was like Miss Staley this is unheard of I've never been able to stay out more than four months he said but I feel like I'm gonna make it this time first time I've made it for 11 months and he sent me pictures of himself in his nice clean clothes looking good and he was like you know this is what every offender needs when they get out is somebody who will help and I always tell them if you leave and you run into a brick wall before you make a bad decision call me back and tell me what you need what what direction you need so that you don't uh, mess up the mindset of people working in corrections has always been once you leave don't call back you know you belong to the community now we're not here to help you but South Carolina Department of Corrections has changed their outlook on that and we let them know call us so we can give you point you in the right direction, hook you up with the resource that you need so that you don't make that mistake, you know. And so that's something that I think is, is very important that they know that they can call on us if they need us for assistance before they make the wrong step. Okay, Nina, I'm going to count that as your final, Thank you. your final <laughs> thing for the audience and for, for you two. Um, just quick two to three minutes, what do you want to leave them with most because I want to leave time for them to ask questions too. So go ahead. Yeah, just ask a, a quick uh, build off of that, and the root of your question that I heard really, I think Silas is about sort of institutions and leaders, and how what 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 does it take to drive change, right? So part of what the and it does take a certain amount of courage, and it does take I think real personal leadership, but part of what the Center for Open Hiring has at Grayson is set up to do, in part, is to fill the gap that you articulated after the Fair Chance Hiring you know, coalition and the White House conference, but is to be to be a collaborative learning space for folks who can come and develop leadership skills around open hiring, around fair chance hiring. It also enables employee swaps because it really helps to see and to talk with someone who is an open, who has been hired through the open hiring process and to then talk with another early adopter company about how does that, how does it actually work? Um, and the other gap that the Center for Open Hiring we're already developing, even though it's not fully operational or even fully launched yet, is around standards and best practices. So working with other businesses and other community leaders to try and figure out, well, what are the standards? What does it mean? to have an open hiring system or a fair chance hiring system. So how would you actually implement it and what would it look like? So we, we're trying very hard to sort of codify and share the tools and the learnings that we've accumulated over 35 odd years. I would end with, you can do good while doing business. So even if that's in the traditional setting of doing business, we believe that we have to invest in our people. Our people are what makes our work possible. So if we are setting them up for success, regardless of what part of life they've come from, that's gonna make us better. We get to make them better, they get to make us better. And by proxy, they make their community and our state and, and our nation, all of that, that much better and safer. So yes, that, that's really it. If you're, you can do good by making good choices for your people. So whether that's recruiting from a different pipeline you've never considered, which is, like I said before, that is low-hanging fruit, and you decide to think about people in a new light, I'd say that's, with our work, that's the very first thing that we have to do is we first have to challenge your gut perception of a person with a criminal background. And I mean you personally in this room. Once we can challenge that perception on our individual level, then we can start challenging our professional beliefs. Um, because those are two different things. They don't live together cohesively all of the time. So if we can talk about an individual and their past and who they are now and the ownership and accountability that they take for their past and who they are now and what they've done since, those are our best candidates. If they can talk about that, it doesn't have to be eloquently, but if they can give voice to that trajectory, we know those are the people we want to put our place our bets on. And they are incredible, incredible employees. One of my favorite stories is I've been with the, the corporate company for over seven years. And a few months before I was hired, we hired a gentleman named Ronnie Elrod. He had spent 15, 19 years in prison in Texas. And he was released. And within two weeks, he was working at Dave's Killer Bread. He started at the very bottom rung of our organization in our ovens department. And so this is a commercial bakery. These are large racks of bread. They're hot. They're heavy. And mind you, Ronnie is 50 years old when he enters this role. All of the folks on his team are 25 years old or less. They were placing bets on how long this old man would last. Three weeks into his employment, they said, ooh, we should probably teach him the job because he's still here. He's not going anywhere. 
He's early to every single shift. He's picking up shifts. He's trying to learn every single thing he can about our facility. Fast forward seven years, Ronnie worked in every single department, and as of January of this year, he was the number one highest ranking person in our organization for Dave's Killer Bread. Now, the sad news is, a couple months ago, he was recruited away to another great organization. But the good news is we have over a dozen other people following in his exact same footsteps and dozens more following in theirs. And so that is the story that I think is important, is not only an entry level job and an opportunity, but the chance to excel and promote and become even better. Awesome, thank you. So we've got about mm, 10 minutes, I would say, if we run that long. If, if you guys have audience questions, there's a microphone there. Please speak into it so that it gets recorded. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice in North Carolina, and we're doing this fair chance hiring certification to try to incentivize businesses to hire people with records and show the business community in North Carolina that this is a thing people do. Um, one of the challenges we're facing, we're based in Durham, North Carolina, which is where Duke University is. And we've had so many challenges with businesses that contract with Duke um, with restrictions on who they can hire. Um, and we've tried to reach out to Duke in many different ways, um, but have encountered a lot of challenges. And they're the number one employer in Durham, North Carolina. I was wondering if any of you have had experiences with um, universities um, or schools with fair chance hiring, since they are such large employers. Um, and if you have any advice for working with them when it comes to fair chance hiring. Go for, go for okay, I was going to say, I don't have education specific. I know of a few institutions that I would recommend talking to who are championing the work. Therefore, by proxy, they should be doing the work. So that'd be a good check. Um, so Columbia, for sure, would be one that I would reach out to. Um, I would say usually this message is best delivered by people in their space. So it would be good for somebody from Columbia to speak to somebody to your organization. As much as I love and adore the people that work on the side of human rights and civil rights, those are usually not the right messengers to the private sector or an employer. Those are not the voices that are most respected in that particular space. It's not because they're not doing incredible work, it's just the messenger's wrong. They have the right message, wrong delivery method. So whenever you can get people on the same level or in the same field talking with one another. And I'd say the more informal, the better. That is where I've seen the best work happen is when you're able to have a conversation over coffee. You bring another CEO from another organization just talking about why it's important to them personally. That's when you start working in that personal perception I was talking about. You gotta rumble with your gut first. It wasn't easy for me. I didn't think I would do this work. My original tra trajectory was a ballerina. Far from any of this work at all. Um, but once you start to think about things differently and you meet more and more people and you humanize that story, which I think would probably be really beneficial, uh, that's, gonna see, that's where you see those shifts. It's, it's slow moving, but it is worth that work. So two, two real quick um, ads. One is I think where you might want to start actually is with the Duke Endowment, which is actually mission driven and actually based in Charlotte. And um, if you would like to talk briefly afterwards, I'm a Duke alum, so I'd be happy to talk with you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mary King. I'm with the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency. Um, and uh, for your, uh, just to answer your question earlier, Ms. Walker Staley, um, I, we're helping to in incubate a group of folks who are formerly incarcerated. Uh, the group is called Nation Outside, the voice of farm formerly incarcerated people, and that is what they prefer to be called, yeah. formerly incarcerated people. Um, so my question is um, that, you know, there's a, been a lot of work that's happened around things like ban the box, uh, the new EEOC guidelines, but for formerly incarcerated people, what they really want is to be fully restored so that they've served their time and that there is some opportunity for them to then no longer have to have that scarlet letter F for felon on their foreheads, right? And that there's actually some really great research 
uh, about how long someone has to be out into the community before their risk of reoffending is no greater than someone who's never been in prison. So my question for you, though, as business people is, um, the question is, if, there, if people are pushing forward legislation to actually fully restore people, expunge their record completely, so that at some point in the future, there would be no record. How does that land with business owners? Uh, oh God, okay. you start. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are so many layers to that, and I'd be more than happy to connect with you after. The problem is that our philosophy on the hiring side, so what I would say is rather than pursue it the way that you're talking about, I think the most effective thing is to educate HR to the point where the person in HR who pulled a record, if they see that it's seven years old, that's about the window, right, um, for the likelihood to reoffend. If they see that it's seven years old, they just they just pass it. The, the, the other problem around what you're talking about is that Unfortunately, and, and they do have some justification for this, but if you talk about complete and total expungement, delete the records, get rid of them entirely, law enforcement immediately, immediately comes to the table and says, this is a public safety problem. You can't restrict our access. You can't get rid of old records. We, we have to have it. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot. I mean, it's obvious from this morning, it's obvious from the participants at this conference that law enforcement can be an ally and that leaders, leadership from various parts of law enforcement will come to the table about this discussion. But when you talk about um, we want to make sure that nobody has, can ever get access to that again, it just ends up being a non-starter. So, um, you know, effective sealing is probably the best possible thing, but that doesn't mean that it never it gets seen again, it means that the only people who can see it are law enforcement in very, very specific circumstances. So, you know, if that's what we're talking about, then we've been very publicly supportive of that. Um, you know, it, it seems like every conference I've been to, somebody gets up and says, it was a drug conviction from 1995, and I cannot get rid of it. And that's, that's just frankly ridiculous. I mean, I, you know, um, there's a couple of states who have moved in the direction of automatic, and I think that's where we have to go because, um, unfortunately, this population normally lacks the resources to fight through the system to get their own record expunged. So, you know, we as a society and, and public policy decision makers and criminal justice actors just have to say, you know, for whatever the offense was, we have to agree whatever the look back period needs to be. And then it needs to be a function of the judiciary. You just need to say, all right, that person, they did their time. They've been out for five years. All the research suggests it's not a risk to the public. That record is now sealed and tucked away over here. So that's what I would say. I agree. There's another little trick. So in the age of tech, <laughs> expungement doesn't, it still pops up. You Google a name and you find it expunged or not expunged. So it really does come back to the training of the people making the hiring decisions. There's a lot of really good examples of people doing this work. Um, Johns Hopkins Medicine, uh, they do incredible work. They have uh, Joe Phelps on staff full time and he does all the background screening and reviews. He's a former cop. He loves his job. He loves being able to see people come in, helping them get employment when he's the one that was apprehending them on the streets. Um, being able to make sense of the background check because even if it's expunged, Background screening agencies and all of the places where they pull their data are not one and the same. And so as an employer, you are regularly getting information that may or may not be what you should be seeing. And so that's one of the reasons training is so important is that you're going to see stuff like arrest records, which you shouldn't be using in an employment decision. However, now you've seen it, it's in your brain. So how do you keep leaning through that and pushing through that to make the best possible decision? Just a real quick one. So uh, denying history right? It's never a good idea because history is going to come back to bite you. So it's a question of reorienting ourselves to understanding history, being interested in history, showing compassion, and again from the Grayston perspective, non-judgment. Something may have happened and you go forward. So I, I want to be respectful of the proceedings with the rest of the conference. In about five minutes downstairs, Governor Nathan Deal is going to give a keynote. Um, I see that there are half sandwiches on this side of the room. Um, I'd like to say that if, if anybody has a, a question still, 
we, you guys okay with, you guys okay? Okay, so we would be happy to answer more questions, but I just wanted to make sure that the folks who wanted to see that keynote, um, you can get downstairs on time and, and thank you for coming. So does, are, are there more questions? Do we have one? Yeah, okay, go ahead. And, and thank you for coming and if you just wanna grab your lunch and go, that's totally all right. Hi. Okay. My name is uh, Sadiq Center for Core Innovation. I'm also a student here at John Jay. Um, I was so there's like a lot of talk with um, like different classifications of crimes. So you have your violent crimes, um, people are hiring felons. I want to know specifically with um, individuals convicted of sex crimes um, and how they are more so like disenfranchised and marginalized, and they face a lot of additional barriers um, to employment, other and housing and everything like that. Wondering how that work looks different for you, or how the engagement with um, other partners or individuals um, looks different on your end. That's a fun one. Um, so for us specifically, for our company, all employment decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. It doesn't matter what the crime was, as long as we can put that into context and it doesn't apply to the job. You touch on probably the most difficult one, uh, next to arsonists, uh, is what we found. And so it's, it's important, and this is where training comes back into play, it's important that things go into context. So, for instance, in the state of Oregon, sex offender means over 600 different things. On one side of the spectrum, it means the terrible, horrible things that my gut first says. On the other side of the spectrum, it means peeing in a public park. So when we have a little bit of context, it's like, oh, well, I mean, you shouldn't have done that, but I can, I can work with that. Um, the other one that's really important, and this is where having a conversation is really, really important, and where a lot of ban the box ordinances don't allow for it anymore. And that is, if we can have a conversation about that and I get to know you and know who you are now and where you've come from that, I don't care. If I can't have that conversation and I can't see that trajectory of how you've decided to make different choices, I can't really work with that. I can't build that trust relationship that I need to be able to do to say like, you are the best person for this team. Um, so context is everything, and there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done particularly for that. I'm sorry, I don't have a magic answer for you. We have awesome. All right, well, thank you guys, and um, again, Governor Deal is going to be on in two or three minutes downstairs.